Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, meanwhile, while waiting, um, please fill in the feedback for Danny. You can scan the QR code or use the URL uh, given at the bottom. So next up, we have Dr. Lukman Aziz. Ever wondered how biomechanics can improve one's sport performance? Well, hear it from the expert himself, Dr. Lukman. Dr. Lukman is currently working with members of our national SILAT team as they gear up towards the next major game. A little more about Dr. Lukman. He completed his PhD in the University of Western Australia's School of Sports, Science, Exercise and Health, and is currently a sports biomechanist at the Singapore Sport Institute. He has nine years of research experience in biomechanics, tutoring, providing strength and conditioning training, and holding sports science related seminars. Dr. Lukman is part of a sports science team which supports the national athletes in Singapore, where he applies his knowledge in biomechanics to assist and improve and monitor the performance of athletes with the aim of maximizing their potential. His research interests include the use of wearable portable sensors for training load monitoring, visual perceptual motor skills coupling, and injury risk assessment, both in sporting and the clinical field. With such credentials, I can't think of a better candidate to walk you through this session. So without further ado, let's hand over the time to Dr. Lukman. Thank you for your nice uh, introduction, Rafael. Can you please make me the host? Thank you. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay. Rafael, can you see my slides? Yes, Ken. Perfect. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the Singapore Sports Science Symposium. Uh, now, following up uh, from yesterday's presentation, uh, in Singapore, we can't play the numbers game. We can't simply say that our, our thousand athletes, uh, one will be a future world champion. So for today, I'm going to share a little bit about the sports biomechanics team at SSI. Our, the, the model we subscribe to, uh, uh, which is called the structure, strength, skill, and strategy model, and how we aim to use this model to enhance the performance and reduce the risk of injury of our athletes. Now, going back to Leonardo da Vinci's time, this is his rendition of the, uh, the perfect man, the perfect physique. He says that this is the, the man with the perfect physique, with the arm span as tall as his height. Now, if I would ask you, uh, you, would, you, you would definitely tell me that uh, if I were to apply this template of a man in all the different sports, would he be successful? Perhaps not. Back in the early 1900s, okay, uh, in basketball, uh, the picture on the left, uh, Mr. Faust, he stands at about almost six feet tall, 74 kilograms. Now, back in the day, top football, uh, top basketball player, sorry. Now, Kevin Durant, one of the best in the world, towers over him at 206, over two meters, 104 kilograms. See, Evolution of the sports physique has definitely changed. Picture on the right shows a sh uh, short putter, Robert Garrett. Mr. Robert Garrett, it's about 180. Some sources say it's 188, uh, 63 kilograms to 88 kilograms. Uh, we're not sure exactly, but it fluctuates around there anywhere in between. This is the, uh, the physique uh, anthropometry of a short putter back in the day. Today, we have Mr. Majewski. 197 centimeters, a whopping 141 kilograms. See how much has changed since the 1900s. Now, bring back to weightlifting. Uh, picture on the left, we'll see Mr. Henry Henry Davis, very popular weight class a weightlifter back in the day. He weighs in at about 235 pounds, just about 105 kilograms, and his uh, clean and jerk scores were about 401 pounds. And today we have the Iranian Hercules. Uh, he set the record at, you no, know, he's a heavyweight, lifts at a whopping 579 pounds. A lot has changed since then. But what's more interesting, if you look at the flyweight, Kim Ung-guk from North Korea, he only stands at five feet two, he's 137 pounds, and cleans and jerk at 384 pounds. Okay, almost as close as the heavyweight back in the day. Okay. What has changed? You know, sports science has introduced People are training smarter, 
people are be more targeted in training. People are actually, uh, you know, talent identification also plays comes into play when it comes to the numbers game. Okay, looking at the uh, the rower picture on the right, uh, Miss uh, Mrs. Bayer stands at five foot five. She was uh, known as the mother of rowing back in the day. I still known as the mother of rowing in America. Compare her with uh, Napkova, uh, world champion, Olympic gold medalist. She stands at five foot eleven. Okay, five foot five, five foot eleven, big difference. Okay, if I look at this graph on my right, it shows the significant changes in the uh, height of the female rover over the years since 1930s. And you see that medalist seems to be taller than Miss, Mrs. Bayer. So a lot have changed in the sports physique. I really like this picture. It shows uh, female athletes across different sports. Okay, different sports, different physics. You would think that, no, they have different strength uh, requirements and different skill set. Okay, this shows you that, no, perhaps different sports, not perhaps, different sport will require certain demands in terms of just how the athletes is built, the structure, the strength requirements, and the skill aspect to it. And that is where we propose this model of structure, strength, and skill. Okay, structure uh, deals with the machine design or the athletes, how the athlete is built. Strength, uh, I do not need to elaborate further on how important is strength. Uh, Dr. Tim and Shukamel and Mr. Kelvin Chua has have, uh, presented the importance of strength. So strength is the work's capacity. I don't have the strength, I cannot move. Okay, and finally is the skill. How am I able to coordinate all my body segments to execute a particular motion? Okay, and strategy comes into play uh, whereby, okay, now I have the particular structure, skill, uh, strength, and skill. How am I able to execute this skill in a timely manner in the right situation, so strategically? Okay, that's why we see the structure, strength, skill, and strategy model. So, a little bit about structure. We talked about uh, what is structure. Okay, structure deals with the, uh, the individual's morphology. And this includes height, uh, arm or body segments, body composition, joint ranges of motion, posture balance. And joint ranges of motion can include flexibility or mobility. For example, I were to do a shoulder press. Okay, a shoulder press. And I can't bring my arm behind my head. Okay, I'm, I'm able to align the weight of the bar or the dumbbell above my head. Okay, uh, we will to do this, I may not be able to lift the weight optimally. Okay, that deals with the structure of the body. I do not have the correct structure. I may not be able to produce an efficient movement. Strength, uh, strength deals with the muscles and the muscle's ability to generate the force. Okay, what, uh, why is strength important? Why, is, uh, why are muscles important? Muscles you know, stabilizes the body, it controls segments of the body, it moves your body. It supports the load of your body strength. It's very, very critical. We need to look at underlying strength in any sport, in that particular sport-specific movement. Then finally, we have skill. In the video here, you can see a very jacked up uh, individual, right, sprinting against the sprinter. Now, I may have the right uh, strength, but if I'm not built or uh, structurally, I'm not there. Skillfully, I do not have... Uh, I'm not trained as a sprinter, I'm not be able to challenge against a sprinter just by strength alone. Now this uh, picture on the right shows a theoretical model or this deterministic model. Before we attempt to understand or to analyze any sport in biomechanics, it's highly advisable to develop this biomechanical model. So if we look on the uh, top right here, this is a pointer, top here, that's the determinant of interest. That's the performance outcome. Okay, in this case, it's sprinting, right? What are the determinant or variables that would affect the step length? Okay, then you slowly break it down to like a mind map to see how these variables can affect performance outcome. Before we break down the skill, this is what the research that we need to do to develop this theoretical model. Now, Structure, strength, skill has to work. Uh, it can't be can't work independently. Okay, it's uh, interrelated. I do not have the right structure. I do not have the right strength. It's hard for me to execute the skill optimally or as efficient as possible. 
Okay, and top top it off, as mentioned before, strategy comes into play uh, in the skill aspect. Now I have the structure, I have the skill, I have the strength, and now I have the skill. But if I execute that skill in an untimely manner, not the right situation, it will not be the performance outcome may not be favorable. So this is where we strategize and where to when and when to execute that skill. Now, for today, I will talk a little bit about our support in Pencak Silat. Now, Silat is uh, a traditional martial arts. Now, some people say it started off from a kampung martial arts, uh, originate from Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and parts of Brunei. Now, if you can see from the video, Silat requires you know, physical proudness. You know, you've got to be strong, you've got to be fast, you've got to be tough. Uh, there's a lot of explosive movements in it. How do we, in our team, apply the structure, strength, skill, strategy model to our support in SILAT? Now, today I'm just going to present concept, what we did. It doesn't describe the full picture, just part of it. Just to give you an idea on how we can apply this model in the sport of SILAT. Now, in SILAT, uh, we have... Uh, Year after year, fortunately, we have the. I'm very proud to say that uh, we've been able to produce uh, Sea Games champion, uh, world champions at the junior and world, uh, senior level. So it's one of the spots to look up for. It usually, best us fruit. Now, before we uh, talk about structure, strength, and skill, it's good to no, mention earlier to develop this theoretical, biome biomechanical, or deterministic model. This is to show, okay, in SILAT, uh, what are the requirements of the sport in terms of the uh, skill aspect? Uh, what needs to be done? In SILAT, there are two branches. There's the combat aspect, and there's the artistic aspect. For today, I'll just talk about the combat aspect. Now, in combat SILAT, we know that it's a fighting sport. Yeah, I need to engage. There's counter attacks, there's offense, there's attack, there's also defense. What are the variables in each uh, form of attack or defense? We need to have this understanding first. Now, moving on to structure, uh, there's many different ways to look at structure. Okay, early research by uh, Peter and Bukadis showed the uh, morphology of the Silat athletes compared with uh, karate athletes. Now, back in the day, uh, or maybe 10 years ago, even now, the research, the literature in SILAT is lacking. So uh, it's good that you know, when we collect our data, we compare it with uh, sports who are more established, such as karate. Now, looking at the structure morphology of an athlete, I can say that, okay, for this particular weight class, if I analyze a 100 elite SILAT athlete, that in this weight class, they need to be in this particular uh, Sumato type, for example. Sure, I acknowledge the fact that they may be outliers, outliers that uh, may be away from the norm in a lighter weight class, but may be more endomorphic. But so far from my experience, uh, all elite select athletes of that particular weight class will look the same, will stand the same. Now, moving on still to its structure, if I were to use the example of a uh, kick, Maybe a sidekick. I can't stand up, sorry. A uh, sidekick. Uh, it requires a fair degree of mobility in my hips. You know, I, I need to raise my leg up and to kick, you know, like a front kick, a sidekick roundhouse, right? If I lack the mobility in my hips, my knee, if I'm unable to move in a certain way, past a certain range, I may not be able to perform the uh, technique optimally. I'll possibly lead to decrease in performance and may increase my risk of injury. Example, I kick a, my opponent, my opponent catches my leg, pushes my leg up in an attempt to take me down. If I can't control, my, my, my joint can't move in that range of motion, I will definitely fall. Yep. So mobility is something that uh, is vital in a sport such as Silat. So how do we access mobility? There are many, many ways to assess mobility. One of the uh, commonly used assessment that we use is called a uh, functional movement screening from Gray Cook. Now, a disclaimer, this is not a diagnostic uh, tool. This is an assessment tool, a general tool, 
to assess for general movement. Okay, and there's a battery of seven different tests, which aims to assess range of, range of motion, uh, balance and stability, and symmetry. Okay, I'm not going to go through all. I'm just going to pick like uh, one or two. Uh, we see here it's the uh, it's the dip squat. Uh, we've got the athlete to do a deep squat. Oftentimes, uh, in silat, what you need to do is you need to maintain an upright posture, but squat as low as you can when someone goes for the sweep. Okay, when someone goes for the sweep, you need to lower your center of gravity, make sure you have a good uh, sense of balance and base, uh, then to prevent yourself from getting taken down. Okay, a deep squat, and oftentimes as well, when we go to the gym, and when they go to the gym, uh, they will prescribe you know, squatting exercises because you know, squats is one of the key exercises in a lot of sports. Uh, but if I can't do a squat, uh, I would need to work on my structure first. So a deep squat can be used as a general screening tool to look whether there's any uh, mobility issues in the joints uh, and how you control. One of the other uh, structure assessments that we do is the active leg raise, okay? Uh, to look at the mobility of the hip and possibly uh, tightness of the knee and the tightness of the hamstring and the control of the leg while going up. So the purpose of this test is to see whether you can hit this, uh, this three point score, whereby the ankle needs to move past this pole. Okay, ankle needs to move, not, not quite, so I'll probably give that a three and a half. Uh, the idea is when we assess uh, the top elite athletes, we notice that the, uh, the score they will reach is definitely three or even more than three. Yep, so that is the gauge saying that, okay, perhaps in this particular exercise, that, uh, which looks at hip mobility, possibly hamstring tightness and control, that they need to hit a certain mark. If they don't hit this certain mark, then we can uh, possibly go to uh, more specific, uh, possibly hamstring test, but the hips control the Thomas test to see, uh, to give more resolution in what uh, is the issue, whether it's a joint issue, is it a tightness of the uh, muscle issue. Okay? Now that we look at the structure, okay, this is one of many uh, different ways that we can assess structure. Let's go to the strength. Now, what aspects of strength in Silat are we looking at? Okay. Back in 2002, uh, our very own Dr. Rashid Aziz published a paper looking at the uh, Silat athletes, uh, the physiological responses in the Silat uh, combat uh, match. And he found, or they found that uh, due to the nature of the sport, every engagement they have in combat situation lasts not more than six seconds. Sure, uh, each bout is two minutes and three bouts, six minutes in total. So there's an or, uh, there's, uh, that aerobic base that you need to develop. Okay, but most of the uh, engagement comes or utilizes the anaerobic systems. And I'm not going to attempt to step into the boundaries of exercise physiology. So I'm just going to say that, you no, know, based on this study, select athletes would need to have some form of strength and you need to be quite explosive because they're utilizing their anaerobic strength or anaerobic energy system. Now, Dr. Rashid, back in the day, uh, he did uh, assessments of the upper limb and lower limb in uh, a physiological power output test and found uh, these parameters. Now you may ask, oh, look, man, why do, are we comparing uh, our select athletes with, for example, judo athletes? Why are we comparing our select athletes with a Taekwondo athletes now? now again, back in the day, the uh, literature in select is very, very minimal, it's really lacking. To give, uh, it's great to have a form of comparison in other martial arts to see where do our athletes stand. Okay, for example, top Taekwondo athletes in Czech Republic, uh, how do they stand compared to the Singapore uh, select athlete? Because you now, uh, when it comes to kicking, very, very similar. Sure, the rule set differs, but when it comes to the kicking or lower body strength, we shouldn't differ that much. So this is a gauge to how we can actually monitor the strength output of our athlete. Fast forward to today, working together closely with Mr. Reynold Joseph, our SNC coach, uh, we assess, we can assess maximum uh, strength output and power and rate of force development through this uh, uh, exercise or test called the isometric mid type pool. Okay, this test has been shown to be a reliable test to measure you know, the explosiveness of an action of maximum strength. 
Now, just to lighten the mood slightly, I will show you results from our multiple world champion and uh, comparing with a perfect specimen like myself. Okay, this is the world champion. Shows the basically this is an IMTP pool. Stand on top of the force plate. Sorry, IMTP is measured through a force plate. Okay, they need to do like uh, it's a, I think the, uh, the the knee is set to about 120 degrees, where the athlete has to push and pull on the bar isometrically, and they will generate this graph. Okay, just look at the purple line right here. Purple line shows you this is the peak force, and I mean the rate of force development is not shown here. Our multiple world champion produce about 4,000 newtons of force, uh, compared with his body weight is 4.63 times uh, the athlete's body weight. Physical specimen like myself, about 2,000 newtons of force, 3.26 uh, times my body weight. Now, after looking at these results and you know, uh, give it heating advice from the strength and conditioning coaches, perhaps I need to hit the gym slightly more. Now, this just gives you a comparison of uh, how we assess for strength in a general setting. What we do with this data, get together with the coaches, talk together with the coaches and see if I can, if we can uh, uh, provide interventions to actually improve this course. Now, what I talked about was uh, general uh, strength measures, general strength tests uh, to assess strength in our select athlete. What was specific strength measures? Okay, uh, let's go on to the concept of the kinetic chain of exercise. Imagine me reaching out some, for something, reaching out for something. The kinetic chain tells me that, okay, there are segments in my body, which is the arm, the joint segments, uh, which is the shoulder, elbow, and wrist joints, and the segments which are my arm, forearm, and hand. I need to work in a coordinated manner to reach for a drink. Okay, I need to work in a coordinated manner to reach a drink. This is deemed the kinetic chain. Okay, where one joint affects the movement of another joint. Now in Silat, because there is plenty of uh, kicks and punches, uh, you know this concept with boxes and stuff, all this plant your foot on the ground, the foot is the driving force to a punch. Okay? We can analyze the planting foot, perhaps put a force bit. This is, uh, this is the protocol which we're gonna uh, roll out very soon. Pull out the force bit and ask the athlete to kick on top of the force or punch on top of it and look at the force profile. One of the things that we can measure strength is we can do a correlation with the speed of the movement. Okay, going back to Newton's second law, the law of acceleration, I have my face, I can measure the acceleration of my face. Okay, the faster I accelerate, mass times acceleration will lead, if I have a higher acceleration, will lead to higher amounts of forces. Make sense? So the faster I accelerate with the same mass, the more force I will produce. So how do we measure strength in this aspect? Well, I can use 3D motion analysis. I can use wearable portable sensors, uh, which are commonly available. Now, uh, these, these sensors are not uh, that expensive. No problem. I say, hey, look, man, I do not have this, this uh, fancy equipment. How do I uh, analyze uh, the, the speed of movement? No problem. Nowadays, everyone has a phone. Can't see the phone. Everyone has a phone. Uh, inside the phone, I mean, everyone has good cameras. You can take a video of that particular movement in that particular plane. See, I punch. Uh, you can use a free software such as Kinovia, and you can track the velocity or displacement of that punch, and you can uh, uh, churn out simple speed uh, velocity profiles from there. Now just to bring you in the literature previously, not in Silat, but in boxing and in karate, this is the kinetic, the kinetic chain I was talking to you about. Now, should I assess uh, strength, which is, this is also related to skill. Look at the, the graph on the left here. It shows my right arm, my trunk, and my pelvis, okay? The peak of each uh, graph shows you uh, the, the summation of velocity. What do you mean summation of velocity? My trunk needs to move first, then the extension of my right arm or my arm. Okay, it needs to be in particular, I don't extend my right arm and uh, rotate my trunk. Okay, I will not move efficiently that way. If I can get a profile of these peaks and how they coordinate themselves, I could possibly uh, tell that, okay, hey, perhaps uh, we go through some resistance band training, in the future, uh, it might increase your peak velocity because research has shown in, in the past that you no know, simple resistance band exercise would actually increase kicking and uh, 
punching velocity. And the graph on the right uh, simply shows you a kick. Same concept. The hip comes first, the knee comes first at the peak, then finally the ankle just before the foot hits the pad. Okay, this is what I mean by kinetic chain of events. Okay, you can look at uh, the velocity of a particular punch uh, to quantify select specific strength measures. Now that I have uh, covered a little bit about the structure, covered a little bit of the uh, strength, now we'll go into the skill. In 2018, uh, again, Dr. Rashid Aziz Satib uh, with Jackie Su uh, analyzed the matches of the 2015 SEA Games and 2016 World Championships. Okay, they looked at the techniques commonly used in the elite of the elite, so semi-finalists and finalists, okay, the most successful of them all. They analyzed over 160 fights, and what they found was uh, that there are certain variables that they use uh, more commonly than the uh, less uh, the non semifinalists and finalists. Okay? And this paper was published uh, in 2018. Now, with this example, we know that, okay, these are the techniques commonly used in elite select athletes, right? We, biomechanics team, came up with this visual perceptual motor skills research. And our uh, aim to excel the skill component in select. Okay? What is VPMS? Now, if I were to give you an example of riding a motorbike or driving or cycling, when I cycle, I don't look exactly one meter in front of me. I look further far ahead because I need to process that information, then I can react. If I were to ask you to hold a pole, a long pole with two fingers, you'll probably look at the top of the pole rather than your fingers, correct? You can try this out later on. Okay? What uh, The point is that Whatever you see, whatever you perceive, it's how you will eventually act. Now, if bringing to the constraint led perspective model by Newell, look at the uh, triangle on the left. It states there's uh, three components. There's the organism, environment, and the task. Only when these three components are satisfied, when the rule is met, the physical performance can be attained through perception, action coupling. Let me give you an example. Say the organism is a select athlete, the environment is a select man uh, against a select opponent, and the task is to respond to a select front kick. Okay? The athlete is supposed to respond to that stimulus. Okay? For just before the kick has been initiated, he will perceive when the kick is initiated, still perceive and that perception information will be translated into movement, which is the reaction to that stimulus, and thereby leading to the physical performance. Now, if I change one of the three components, okay, for example, or the organism is a silat athlete, the environment is a silat mat, for example, but the task is to kick a soccer ball. It doesn't make sense. The physical performance will not be a silat specific physical performance. So the takeaway message is that the task, environment, and organism needs to work interplay together. Rule cannot be broken for that particular physical movement to occur. So with this in mind, we, we created a uh, game environment in the laboratory. Okay? What we did was we filmed uh, in 3D uh, the uh, CLAT specific scenarios from Dr. Rashid's paper, uh, the most commonly used technique. Uh, film recorded a live opponent and projected this in 3D in our lab space. Okay, we projected it in 3D uh, just to provide that stimulus. We got 3D glasses on the participant and we measured what they're looking at visually. This is the visual perceptual side uh, through an eye tracker. If you notice that there's an eye tracker at the backpack behind the athlete's, uh, at the athlete's back, coupled with uh, 3D motion analysis, the cameras, Okay, to get movement data. And uh, we wanted to assess where they're looking at and how they're responding to this particular stimulus. Okay, stimulus are randomized uh, to uh, create a more uh, realistic combat situation. And because it's projected in 3D and there is a select athlete in front, we satisfy, partly satisfy the environment and we satisfy the task to respond. 
uh, by in the constraint -led model, the rules have been met. So what did we find? We found that the elite silat athletes fixated or looked focused more on the trunk of the participant. Okay, the participant will be doing this just before the hip strike, they're looking at the trunk. Okay, we proposed that our elite silat athlete uh, employed a uh, pivoting strategy. Okay, I centrally focus my keys to the athlete's trunk so that I can utilize my peripheral view. You might ask, hey, look, why would I want to use my peripheral view? Uh, research has shown that, you know, that there are receptors in the eye that's called rods. And uh, peripheral view, these rods, which are located in your peripheral view, uh, are able to detect information faster, sends it back to your brain to be processed faster. This means that things that comes up from our periphery gets processed faster. Okay, by pivoting my, uh, my gaze in the middle, I can, cons I can look at my peripheral view. If my gaze is just erratic, I'm just looking at everything everywhere, it's very hard to have a uh, designated, you no, know, I can't establish uh, that space for my peripheral view. So what we did with this uh, piece of research or this information is we got back to the coaches and say, hey coach, uh, since it's elite select athletes are looking at the trunk, perhaps, or just perhaps you can you know, ask the sub elites to look at the trunk just before responding to an attack as a strategy to bridge the gap between elite and sub elite athletes. Now, it's great that the uh, sub elite athletes get a little bit of help from this, but what about the elite athletes? Now, elite athletes look at the trunk, which is great. How do I move forward with this VPMS research? How do we move forward with this VPMS research? So the next piece of the research, which we are intending to do very soon is the occlusion training. Okay, what do I mean by occlusion training? I know now that the elite athletes are focused on the trunk and focus on the trunk, utilize the peripheral view, and this is how they make decisions, right? What if I occlude the trunk out? Okay, what if I include the trunk out, perhaps provide a little bit of distraction in the trunk? Can this change decision making? Okay, if you can change decision making, is this trainable or not? Can I train this? Can I, for example, increase the difficulty or include the trunk uh, over, put them into an intervention program every week, uh, occlude li uh, little by little parts of the trunk? Okay, if I can improve my decision making, improve my reaction time, perhaps this can be very beneficial in rolling out to the training of our select athletes. Now, the other findings that we found, which was uh, quite interesting, was if you look at the variables here, those are the commonly used variables in uh, uh, elite select athlete. We found that our elite select athletes respond slowest when it comes to the sidekick. Okay, slow, but still they're able to respond, but slow as compared to the rest of the other techniques. Okay, now if uh, our opponents were to find out, they will say, hey, this is a strategy. This is where the strategy, the strategy links with the skill. This is a strategy to use against our athlete. Okay, they are weak in uh, sidekicks. I'm going to use sidekicks against them. But obviously, we're not going to let that happen. So we talked together with the coaches and said that, hey, uh, leading up to the 2018 uh, Asian Games, uh, world champions, let's cross train or bring in athletes who are very proficient at uh, uh, executing the sidekick. So this is a form of strategy we use so that our skill can be well-timed, our skill can be perfectly executed, optim optimally executed. Now, uh, fortunately, we got this paper uh, published at the at ISBS 2020 conference as oral presentation. And uh, moving forward also, uh, in March this year, everything needs to be put on hold because of the circuit breaker, right? And in circuit breaker, our athletes were uh, asked, uh, not our athletes, everyone was asked to stay at home as much as possible. So our athletes do not have access to training facilities. Uh, all, uh, most if not all, were asked only to do physical activities in their home. Uh, mostly on weight training, but we know that in a particular sport like Silat, physical training alone is not enough. 
they need to respond to a particular stimulus. So this gives us the opportunity, the only alternative to roll out the BPMS training at home. Okay, you know from the literature saying that no, just by practicing against a 2D projection on the wall is enough to elicit some form of maintenance or skill. And over a period of uh, a fortnight, the tasks or the videos or the playlist that we uh, employ or deploy to the uh, athletes gets a little bit difficult. Okay, these are alternatives. So we thought that the uh, that we believe that the BPMS training at home uh, may provide uh, useful alternatives based on the current circumstances of this circuit breaker. Before I end up, I would like to say that the uh, this model, the structure, strength, and scale, each component cannot work independently. They're all interrelated. I need to have the correct structure, I need to have the underlying strength, and I need to execute or coordinate my segments to execute that skill optimally. But if I can't execute that skill, I, but I need to execute that skill in a timely manner, in the right situation, and that's how I use strategy into play. Before I go off, I would say that in 2018, the CLAT team uh, had their best ever performance with seven gold, six silvers, and seven bronze. We have the best female athlete and best overall team. And I would like to say that it has been a pleasure working with the Singapore CLAT Federation. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, SSI, for giving me the opportunity to collaborate with them. I look forward to many more years. And thank you, everyone, for attending my talk. Thank you, Dr. Lukman, for that interesting sharing. So now we'll move on to the Q&A segment. I think this is a very fascinating topic and for all of you who are watching and would like to find out more or have anything to clarify, do type your questions down in the Q&A chat box below. So um, Dr. Lukman, I think I'll start off with a question of my own. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, for the, you mentioned about um, some uh, struggles you faced during the circuit breaker period. So <coughs> what do you think is the biggest challenge that you and your team face during the circuit breaker period? Well, in biomechanics, there's a lot of, okay, maybe, maybe I just put it towards uh, CLAP training, giving them uh, biomechanic support. It's all, it's all about skill acquisition and learning about skill acquisition. We, we utilize a lot of tools in our analysis. And if I can't get the athletes to come in, it's, a bit, it's not like I simply, uh, no, I, I can't just lift weights. I know a lot of this deals with skills acquisition, skills training. How do we bridge the gap within? Now I know that I can't get that stimulus. What is the best method? So I guess working around ways to uh, help them maintain their skills during period is utmost priority for us. And you now you know, I know that the psychology team has done a lot of visualization training, which also helped and you know, definitely helps with skill acquisition. But again, in the spot like see, like fortunately enough, uh, we, we we prepared some videos based on our research, and we able to partially circumvent uh, the uh, the lack of training on the mat and bring them to their homes. Yeah, that was a that's a big difficulty, but I guess everyone's on the same boat. Uh, we just have to make do with the best alternative that we can. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's uh, one question. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think is more important? Having innate traits and talents that give us an advantage in a sport or being hardworking? Well, uh, I would say both. Uh, I've asked this question to a lot of athletes and all, I mean, I'm, I'm referring to all the select athletes, mm -hmm. that all of them, I would say that they're very talented. When I said, hey, you're very talented, then they also say, no, I'm not, I mean, we can't just be talented. We need to be hardworking. Okay, talent only brings you at a certain level. Okay, at a certain level, I'm not sure which level it is, but at a certain level where everyone's on the same playing field, everyone has talent, is to show your hard work and greed. So I believe that you no, know, everyone, I mean, not only that, you know, talent coupled with hard work, you can't be, it's, it's hard to beat that, that, uh, that formula. But how about those uh, athletes maybe that with not as much talent but are very hardworking, are they able to make it? Like, would they be able to be as good as those who are talented? Uh, I cannot really answer. It's a very hard question to answer. I can answer it based on my experience. Again, based on uh, how do you measure talent, right? Maybe is it because from the day you were born, if you follow the day you were born and see whether at that young age, you're able to perform in a certain way. Uh, I'll give you an example of our athlete, a world champion. I can say his name out, uh, Shaki Juwanda. I've asked him, you know, 
uh, he said that he's, he's not talented. He actually bloomed at a very late uh, age. He said that it's all his hard work, failures, success that helped him build the way he is. He's a three-time world champion and said that it's all about hard work. He actually started late. He started later than our current batch of world champions. So based from that experience, from my experience, I say that you no know, hard work itself can land you in uh, the top of the top elite of the elite, the world championship level. As you said, okay, if you are hardworking, you're definitely going to be a world champion. There's much more factors that can affect that, not just biomechanics, not just research, everything. Yeah, yeah. But yes, hard work itself, I, I believe that you no. Know, what, what, what else you got, right? You don't have talent. You got to work hard. You got to work extremely hard. Don't yeah, give up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, we have a question here from Jonathan. Um, were there any measurable benefits from the home video training by the SILA athletes? Nope. Sorry, that was a great question, uh, Jonathan. The only measurable benefit is from the subjective uh, responses that uh, we got from uh, the athlete. Okay, and this is, yeah, sure. I definitely think that it's beneficial because it gives us some form of stimulus because most of them do not have that stimulus to be in front of them. However, uh, leading up to the VPMS research, we, are, we plan to quantify the efficacy of the video skills training. That we haven't, we haven't reached that position yet, but it's in the pipeline, it's the research pathway for our VPMS research. Thank you, Jonathan, for the question. Okay, I think that's about all the time we have. So um, let's move on to the next slide. There will be a feedback form for Dr. Lukman. Um, please take the time to fill it up while we take a short five-minute break before we'll be back soon. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you. Thank you.